music. It's not just part of our daily lives, it's part of our wrestling fandom as well, and it has been for decades. That's where this show comes in, Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling, hosted by Andrew Rich. Hey, that's me. Each episode delivers a different topic with a variety of great guests, fun conversations, musical analysis, and of course, a heartfelt pun or two. New episodes drop every other Tuesday on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice. Check out Music of the Mat only on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Hello there, my name's Neil David and I'm the host of Euro Graps Express, the podcast exclusively dedicated to the wrestling of Europe. If it's wrestling and it happens in Europe and it's good, we talk about it. Whether it's Rev Pro, Progress, WXW, Passion Pro, Pro Wrestling Chaos, Pro Wrestling North, we don't care, we talk about them all. If it's good and it's exciting, I want to share it with you. We're on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Check us out on the feed. Check us out on Twitter at EuroGrapsEXP. And join us for chat about European wrestling and a little bit of chat about cheese. Hopefully see you there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. Uh, I am Jesse Collings, your host as usual. Uh, I want to thank everyone for the kind words and feedback we've gotten for our last few episodes. Um, this is a reminder that we are now part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. And that means that you can access this podcast pretty much anywhere. If you've got, you use Spotify for podcasts, you use Apple Podcasts, the iTunes store, you use Amazon, any way you get your podcasts, you can find the show on that service. Um, and that's courtesy of the Voices of Wrestling Network. Um, so I'm really appreciative of that. I'm really appreciative of all the new people that have been picking up the show since we've got uh, since we've appeared on the network. Uh, we've had two great episodes. First one with uh, Rich Krejci, and the, our last episode was with uh, Maura Johnson. And you know, Maura, of course, is a uh, you know former editor of the Village Voice, current writer for the Boston Globe, uh, Boston College journalism professor. Uh, and joining me today is someone uh, equally as successful as Mara. It's Trevor Dame. Trevor, how are you? <laughs> you know what? I, I need to stop this podcast. For, how dare you, sir? How dare you? you, you the, yeah, former editor of the Village Voice. And then um, I wrote a tweet that, that made 15 people laugh once. I don't know. So, yeah, yeah, about the equal stuff. But, uh, Jesse, this it's, is, it's this, great. That was all. This is all planned. I've had, I've, had a, I've had a long revenge plan for you, Dame. Yeah, honestly, you know, I was going to say um, it's an honor to be on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, and it could not go any worse than my previous experiences on this network with Joe Gagne. So, I mean, like, you, you literally can't – even that is, it's you're not going to make it worse than anything Joe's ever done to me. So, um, yeah. so try your worst. It's, it's not going to It's not, not going to work. So, like, uh, I guess probably like two years ago, um, I was doing the, the, the Voice of Wrestling Hall of Fame audio on the flagship podcast, right? Um, yeah. And the order was, I think, so I think Carl Stern came on and did like, uh, uh, you know, histor historical, U.S. historical. And then uh, Alan 4L came on and did Japan. So just two like excellent guests that have incredible perspective on, on the entire ballot. Um, and then you came on and you did, I believe, U.S. Modern. Yes. Uh, and then I was I was the last one on and I did non-wrestlers and i was coming on i was like man coming on after carl coming on after alan like and, and i can't even be self-deprecating about my own knowledge because dame already got on first and he did it in <laughs> front of me so i have to i can't i don't even have that i apologize I, I i if i had known that jesse i would have tried to be a bit more confident i would have i would have paused the uh the slight stick but honestly it's kind of real it, it just to set things easier for you but i know the exact same thing i was like I got so psyched out for that. I mean, I think I did decent, but I got so psyched out for like, you listen to those every year, you know, Alan and Chris Zellner, like you can give them a name and they're just going to fill 20 minutes with like insight and stuff. And I, I always, I've told a couple of people this, but I was so scared about doing it that year. I read like an entire book about the junkyard dog in two days. I was like, I've got to study for this. I've got to, I've, you know, I've got to research. I've got to make sure just in case I've got to know all of this. Yeah, no, it was like my first appearance on the Voice of Wrestling Network proper. And like, I like went all out with like, a, I had a massive note sheet. And honestly, it's really come in handy because it's really given me a lot of insight into some of the non-wrestler candidates. Other people, maybe I would have dismissed, maybe people I wouldn't have researched as hard. 
but after going through it and like i suddenly became like a big morris siegel supporter because i actually had to figure yeah. out who morris siegel was which i'm sure 99 percent <laughs> of voters don't do um but uh anyway i i really what i really reason i, I wanted to have you on the show uh was not to, to do this little sneak attack on your credibility but um was uh you're you're really knowledgeable about ring of honor and you're really knowledgeable about cm punk and you've shared a lot of insight i know uh it's mostly on twitter but also uh in different formats uh over the years and i'll start with this we are we're i think about six and a half months removed um from cm punk's like base i call it his exit from professional wrestling he has the whole he has his final match which is the main event of all out he tears his biceps or triceps and then he has the the po the all out presser where he basically has a meltdown in front of the entire wrestling media, uh, and then of course was involved in a in a physical altercation backstage, and I think it's time to really kind of evaluate what all of that meant and what all that how that has all impacted AEW and wrestling in general. Now that we have a little bit more time and perspective on it. And so my first question for you, Trevor, is do you have kind of like a, what is your biggest kind of general takeaway from the whole all out incident and CM Punk's exit from AEW um, now that we have a little bit more perspective on it? What do you feel like is like the biggest takeaway from that now that we're sitting here on, on March 16th? Um, it, It's tough because the uh, one thing I would go over in my head is like, there's two ways to look at it, right? In the sense of you look at all these guys, like Punk in that press conference, you know, one of the big things he's like, you know, I'm here to make money. I'm here to be successful. I'm here to draw fans to this company. And, you know, you, you look at all these guys on both sides and you think, you know, wherever, you know, I, I'm a person where I believe there's probably blame on both sides. I'm sure there's probably more blame on one side than the other. You know, everyone, your mileage may vary, but, um, you look at both sides and you go, the biggest, most significant st angle, um, a career-defining moment of your career is like it, right in front of you if you just make up with each other. And so half of me, one way of looking at it is to go, when you look at everything happened to All Out and the fact that everything is still up in the air and it's probably still bad blood for all I know, um, is to say – how come you guys you're leaving so much money on the table like why you know especially punk who are, i don't know what his financial life will be like if he'll get paid out if he doesn't come back or or what i don't know but it's like part of me goes you know are you really that willing to throw all of that away but then part of me also thinks of it the other way which is like all these guys are probably millionaires right now unless they spent horribly and that's like well then part of me feels like the other way to look at it is if you're millionaires, maybe, you know, that's the privilege of being rich, you know, is, is, you know, what is the point of having money if not to say fuck you to people you don't like, you know? So I honestly am like, I desperately want all, obviously all those guys to be back in the same company. I would love them to work together, but part of me wants to look at this as, as this really kind of immature, tragic thing, which it certainly is in one, in one form. But then the other half of me is like, how often do we see rich people that seem absolutely miserable who still do things they hate, even though they have the money to walk away from things. And, you know, in that sense, I mean, money lets you say fuck you to people and maybe not enough rich people do that actually. So who knows? Yeah. Who I, knows? Think, I think like having like money, like, Oh, I've got so much, I've got this kind of financial security, so I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. Uh, I feel like that's something that like, people who don't have a lot of money, like say you or I would think. Um, yeah. And, but like, like we see it all the time, like in sports, like guys maybe leave a good, a, a good situation for a slightly more money somewhere else or in movies, like someone who already has a lot of money takes a role because they offered them a sack load of money to do it. Um, so it, it's one of those things where it's like, it always feels like even if you really wealthy money is always a motivator and that's obviously a motivating factor to kind of make up, right? Which is that this is yeah. real box office if they can get it together. Um, but I want to kind of take a step back from like 
imagine because I think we'll get into that later, like kind of imagining what is going to be next and get back to and kind of focus on like what actually happened, um, you know, okay, yeah, at sure. the presser. And for me, like now that we've had some time to think about it and we've seen kind of what AEW has been like since Punk left or since he had his meltdown, to me, like the big takeaway from the all out presser and Punk's exit from the company and the fight and all that is that CM Punk no longer being on AEW has hurt the company from a business perspective. There's clearly an audience that was turned off, um, whether it's they were only there to see Punk and now that he's not around, they're not watching, or his behavior kind of soured them on the company in general. I think that's a clearly something that has negatively impacted the company from a business perspective, from whether you want to use pay-per-view buys, whether you want to use attendance, whether you want to use Google search or Google Google trend data, um, all that stuff is down since Punk has you know lit the company on fire. And I think it's hurt the perception of AEW greatly because it was an ugly incident of unprofessionalism and it gave credence to all of the critics that were saying that Tony Khan was in over his head, that this wasn't a proper wrestling organization, that it was just some Mickey Mouse rinky dink indie thing. And that, you know, the young bucks were political schemers backstage and holding people down or whatever conspiracy theory you want to believe about the young bucks. But it was all, the whole incident really gave fuel to the negative, the, the, the overwhelmingly negative perceptions of AEW that already existed. And so I think both Punk's star power exiting the company, as well as casting a negative light on AEW has really hurt the company. And despite what I believe to be still a high quality product, good week to week shows, excellent pay-per-views, uh, the elevation of new talent, despite all of those things, they haven't really captured uh, the audience that they lost from, from the CM Punk incident since then. And I think that to me is, is a huge takeaway from, from the whole incident. And I guess another reason why you would want to bring CM Punk back because um, it would solve most of those problems. Yeah, I think um, one of the biggest ways Punk being gone, Punk being not in AEW hurts, is I guess the kind of analogy I would make is, let's say you know you're a kid, you come home from school, and your parents surprise you to say, today we're going to take you out to your favorite restaurant, then we're going to see a movie, then on the way home we're going to get ice cream. You know, you'd be so excited. You know, you'd be excited with just one of those things, and then you go to the restaurant, it's a great meal, you go have a great movie. And then on the way home at the last second, they tell you, uh, turns out we're not getting ice cream. All of a sudden, you'd be kind of bummed and disappointed, yet you still had a great day. But it's not what you had like built up in your mind of what you were going to have. And I feel like the problem, the biggest problem Punk brings AW with leaving is almost not just that he's not there to do great work, but that – no matter how good AEW is, and I think, you know, for a lot of periods since Punk's been gone, there's been, you know, there was that initial down, but I think I haven't been so hot in the last few weeks of AEW TV, but like they were on an amazing hot streak for a while. I think the pay-per-view, what might have been the best pay-per-view that, that they had just, they've just done is one of the best pay-per-views they've ever done. But it's one of those things where no matter how good AEW is right now, it's not the AEW that you thought was possible in your imagination. There's always, well, yeah, this was great, but could have been even better if Punk was here, you know? And I think that's a really hard expectation. You know, once you tee something as possible, if you can't deliver it, you, there's a bar you can never meet ever, you know? And, and I feel like that's one of the toughest things, you know, AEW has right now without Punk it is, you know, People are going to go like, man, we never got to see Omega versus Punk. You know, we didn't get to see this match with Punk, this match, you know, you know, they had T te obviously it wouldn't have happened because of his injury, but you know, they were teasing like, oh, it's another summer of Punk. We, we didn't get to see that. We didn't get to see him against the new Japan guys. And there, there's a certain level of disappointment you get, you know, where you assume you're going to see a bunch of amazing things and then you don't get all of them. And so even if you're seeing amazing things, it's not what you imagined. Mm -hmm. And wrestling is always a business based on anticipation. It's really hard to do great business based on like past reputation and like 
pat what you delivered in the past. Like it helps to have a track record, but in the instance like AEW has a great revolution was an excellent pay-per-view, but revolution being an excellent pay-per-view is not necessarily going to make people excited to watch dynamite next week because yeah. it's all about what you can anticipate. Um, and even though like punk delivered a great year from a performance perspective and from a business perspective, um, in a during his time at AEW, now and you're right. There is this perception of like, if AEW can't possibly get uh, a ten out of ten on the excitement scale because CM Punk's not there, and yeah. not only is he not there, but he exited in like a really ugly fashion. If he was merely just injured, um, or he was just like, you know what, I had my year. I'm retired. I, I I had a great time, but I'm just I'm I'm burned out again, and I just I'm gonna take take some take a lot of time away. And, and thank you so much. I'm I'm retiring. Bye. If either of those things were the case, I think you wouldn't have this necessarily little like gray cloud hanging over the company. And because Punk just you know shot his way out of town in the way he did, and we we still ultimately know very little about things like the backstage fight and the what what kind of political games were going on involving. Um, him that because of that there that that really has like this negative perception on the company that it's going to be hard for them to shake um it's it's not um and, and the other thing is that i think like because of the way wwe has done its business and the kind of control it's exerted over the professional wrestling industry generations of fans and, and, and i i'm really one of these fans i don't remember you know, the first wrestling show I remember watching in full was probably in 2005. Oh so, my God. Um, I hate you. <laughs> you know, you like, I'm, I'm 28 years old. Like, it's not like I'm 17. Like, I'm just like, I'm, I'm putting oh. out there and I, I, and I don't, not to make you feel even worse, <laughs> but like, but, I, but I'm talking about, you know, a wide generation of fans are not familiar with the idea of like a wrestler getting mad with a promoter and, and, and quitting. That's something that used to happen all the time. Steve Austin quit WWF like three times, but because that really did, hasn't existed strongly in WWE, they the one example kind of being CM Punk 10 years ago. Um, people are, you know, I think people see the CM Punk exit as like a bigger, a bigger blow than maybe it really is because we're just, we don't live in an environment anymore where that's like kind of a regular occurrence in the professional wrestling industry. That's a great point. I'm really glad you brought that up because yeah, the problem with, you know, not a problem, but one thing is if you've grown up just as a wrestling fan, if you're a young whippersnapper like a Jesse Collings, you know, if you've only grew up since like in the 2000s as a wrestling fan on, for most of this, of the last 20, 23 years, you know, whatever, um, you have really seen one company have a complete monopoly, which is the wrestling industry never had before then. And yes, okay, TNA at one point was, you know, doing a million a week back when that was even more impressive in some ways than it is now. Um, you know, and, you know, Ring of Honor for a few years got kind of significant, all that stuff. But for the most part, the gap between WWE and everyone else was far greater than it even is between WWE and AEW today. And because of that, because they had, you know, in so many ways, a virtual monopoly, for the first time in wrestling, like you had a lot of guys who, if they were unhappy, they weren't going to do jack shit about. It. They didn't really feel how they have a commiserate option. Like, you know, in the old days in the 90s or the 80s, you know, in the in the territory days in the 80s, if you're unhappy, you jump to another territory. In the in the 90s, if you were unhappy, you could bounce between WWE, WWF and WCW back and forth and make, you know, probably similar money and, and get a completely fresh start and maybe jump back again if you prove yourself. And so there wasn't this there, – there was more strife backstage. There was more wrestlers standing up for themselves or saying, I won't work with this person or I'm just going to sit this one out. And I feel like now with AEW, it's not a coincidence that we're starting to see more stories. Like people can say, oh, it's because Tony Khan doesn't know how to run things, blah, 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 which I don't agree with. I, I mean there are certain assets. I think, you know, he's made big mistakes. But like in terms of handling, you know, backstage politics and people. But – I, I think it's more why all of a sudden since AEW came along, you're seeing rest, more of these stories of strife and stuff. One of the big things is 
because it's the first time in 20 years that wrestlers have really had a strong second option in America where, and when wrestlers have options, they have power and they're going to exercise it. They're going to be more willing to say, you know, I don't want to do this job. I'm, I don't want to, you know, work with this guy. I'm, I'm not happy with my booking. I'm going to outright complain about it in public on social media, because if you punish me, well, I'll, I know there's a job waiting for me that will probably be similar money in a coming in, in, in the case of if you're in AEW, as not just as big but bigger in wwe and one thing i was going to ask you actually think about this was and obviously i did not know you were quite so young but like you think back to the 90s you know um you know bret hart and and Shawn michaels had you know they had a hair pulling fight backstage you know that was well documented you know they had also they had their own you know when when Shawn michaels you know said you know in a promo when there was rumors that Bret Hart was having an affair on his wife with Sonny when Shawn Michaels in a public promo says you know you've been having a lot of sunny days that is exactly basically the hangman paging except it, it's even more of an egregious wink I mean I would say you know a guy saying hey everybody uh you know Bret Hart's having an affair cheating on his wife wink is more offensive than hangman page being like hey I'm going to make this very kind of weird coded reference that a lot of people at the time didn't even pick up on that. Maybe you're preventing Colt Cabana from wrestling on the main show. <laughs> like, like, mm -hmm. and, and yet, you know, people didn't react with the vapors back then because one, I don't think we had as much access to the stories, but also because that was more commonplace to have these little shots and to have backstage strife and refusals of, you know, I don't like this creative and stuff. And so part of me, I guess the question I was going to have is like, we we talk you you know you talk about how you know and sure everyone has talked about how unprofessional that punk press conference was and it was and how Tony Khan looked like a deer in the headlights and he did and how damaging that was it should have been stopped way ahead of time and it did but I'm I I sometimes I wonder like if the 90s had press conferences how many wrestlers like 20 minutes after a match with their adrenaline still going with all the politics that washed over them would have had CM Punk moments. You know, I could have definitely seen Shawn Michaels or Bret Hart. You catch them off through the right paper. They had this in front of a mic and 30 reporters and just, they had just had a match that they weren't happy with or some argument they had with a wrestler hours before, before the show started. And you, and you put them in front of a live mic. They might've done the same thing at some point. I bet I promise you almost that you would have seen at least one or two of those. Yeah. Like in the Sean, Sean was basically doing them on, on, a on, on, a you know, on air. Like, and yeah, like, so, like you mentioned, like, uh, like someone, someone mentioned this to me, I forget who it was, but we're talking about like what version of Sean Michaels is your favorite. And I think like most people, I don't know, maybe not most people, but I feel like a lot of people would say that like, you know, his post return, you know, in like 2002 from, from 2002 to the end of his career, it's kind of like a lot of people's favorite Shawn Michaels because he basically just had awesome matches and big moments. Uh, and there wasn't, you know, the baggage of the politicking and things like that hanging over everything. Uh, but someone pointed out, like, I just love Shawn Michaels in like 1996, 1997, because that guy just would say crazy shit all the time. And he'd be <laughs> tripping out and he'd be, you know, very likely under the influence and he'd just be cutting these promos and one of them was like you said the sunny days promo uh and just people said that stuff all the time i mean it is i think that's a a, a tremendous point that like he like think about let's think about cm punk in the moment and i think cm punk was incredibly unprofessional uh and unhinged and i thought he was really unnecessarily uh aggressive towards the wrestling media uh yeah. for absolutely no reason and that was like my first thing i thought about was like solidarity with my brothers in arms uh in the <laughs> sense that like he cm punk should not treat the media like that they essentially accusing them all of not do knowing how to do their job and 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 and, and of and of running with salacious rumors um all of which everyone pretty much denied um but all of that being said like you're right like in cm punk situation is he also tore his just suffered a serious injury he knows he's probably out for a long time which is obviously a huge disappointment to him and he just you know has all this adrenaline going maybe maybe someone said something to him before you know he sat down the presser um i thought you know his, his i i kind of think his his very pre, his whole actions were very premeditated uh, in a sense that i don't think it was quite like spur of the moment like i'm just mad about all this shit and here here it's all coming out 
But I think it's a good, I think you make a really good point about like, if we had these pressers all the time, and if we had them in previous generations, when, you know, the politics were maybe more prevalent, uh, a lot of people probably would have had a CM Punk moment. We, you know, Shawn Michaels is an example. Do you remember Hulk Hogan's like going on the, the, the going on, I think it was Bubba the Love Sponge's show in like 1998, 1999. And he just buried the shit out of like everyone in WCW and particularly he buried Goldberg <laughs> saying that like, I, anyone could win a bunch of matches in a row. He's not really that special. Like just really like, and, and he got in like hot water at the time. Um, that's kind of faded, you know, faded away in, in, in people's memories, but you know, that stuff would have happened all the time if we had the pressers. Yeah. In the nineties, there were things that happened on like a near monthly basis, especially during some periods, probably on a weekly basis that would melt down the internet if it happened today, but they were so commonplace. You just kind of, and, the, and you know, the, the culture was different. You just kind of accept it. Like speaking of Hogan, there was that thing where he was in Japan. He talked about how like the IWGP title was the most important title in the world. Like imagine if like, um, Again, imagine if if Brian Danielson wrestles in the G1 or something this year, and he says that, you know, how many people would, that would be a huge story for Day saying, uh, how could he say that the AW in the mud, AW looks like a piece of garbage now, you know, all all this stuff, you know, things little political things like that, and, and wrestlers kind of going into business, so to speak, for themselves, like that happened all the time, and these and these coded little snipes at each other that really only a very small percentage of the the audience knew what the hell they were talking about, and it infuriated the wrestlers involved with them. That happened all the time, you know. But yeah, yeah, I, I, okay. So one other thing about the punk thing, I would say about the all out press conference, I, I, you to go back to that would just also be, I think one of the saddest parts about it was. Everyone saw it coming. You know, it was like a slow motion car crash. Like I always go back to the Dave Meltzer story in the observer that like people had kind of before, before Dave Meltzer report on it, people had kind of, you know, some people had speculated with that hangman promo, that one workers rights comment prom, comment in his promo meant. And, you know, there had been whispers about stuff and people were wondering, you know, why, you know, is Colt Cabana not ever appearing on dynamite anymore, you know, because of CM Punk, all this stuff. But what really, you know, blew up the story to another level was Dave Meltzer writing a story that basically said, you know, that, look, there's backstage strife between Punk and these other people. And if Tony Khan does not deal with this, this could turn out to be something pretty, pretty bad. And the funny thing, the thing that people maybe don't remember is like a week or two later, Dave Meltzer, I forget it was on the message or the, or the observer, wrote a follow-up where like – people reacted so strongly to that that he kind of walked it back just like a half step ring. Like it's, it's bad, but it's not as bad bad as people are now reacting to and then a week or two later was the all-out press conference and it's like no your your, your first instinct was right like and, but the fact that even he was able to say that i say even he like you know like the most respected wrestling jurors in the world even he but the fact that this is not this is something you like tony though if you want to say something that's damning to tony khan or anyone involved it's not like there weren't people pointing out publicly saying this is going to be a huge problem if you don't deal with it yeah, if I recall, and, if I recall the timeline correctly, I believe Dave reported something like, um, "There is concern backstage that you know Colt Cabana is is not going to is his contract isn't going to be renewed, and that um, one of the reasons might be because of his relationship with CM Punk." Dave, you know, Dave didn't say that. Um, people were telling him that because you know CM Punk doesn't want Scott Colton around, so he's not going to be around anymore um he didn't say any of that and then a few weeks later he reported that like you know oh Cole cabana is going to be moved to ring of honor and that he, there was discussion about his contract not being renewed but a lot of people went to bat for him and he's going to ring of honor um and that was kind of the report and then like and, and one of the reasons that like i think that the, the, the whole thing was very premeditated was he comes out there and presser um and he just he immediately picks Nick Houseman out of the audience and he says, like, you friends with you know, are you friends with Scott Colton? And Nick, who's genuinely he knows Scott Colton, but is not friends with him, and he just goes, No. And then immediately <laughs> CM Punk's like, shit. I, I and he launches him into to it. say yes. It was clearly his in, like, this is good, what's gonna get me to like launch into things. And it's one 
of those things where you ever see a comedian where they're like they have a setup or like or a magician where they're like do you have a doll on you and like the person says no and they're like well i have still got to do this trick anyway. yeah like he it's just like... plowed ahead with it yeah. and he's like he's like are you friends with scott colton no don't, don't, well, fuck don't you do improv with him he's like <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I i was i did improv with him but i we're not friends he's like well anyway I don't give a fuck about Scott Colton. Like, and then he went on his, <laughs> his, his little tirade, but um, it was, it was, you know, I remember watching it and I'm sure you watched it live too. Yeah. And I remember like, uh, just like being like, Oh my God. Like, like are people watching this right now? Are people, what am I, am I, it was one of the most surreal experiences in my life. Realistically, I definitely one of my one of the most surreal experiences of my life as a wrestling fan. Just that whole like, I can't believe I'm seeing this happen. Um, and Tony, like you said, Tony with his deer in the headlights, and Tony said something really interesting uh, in that presser, which is kind of forgotten. But it was kind of after CM Punk left, and he said something like, "You know, people might not like what CM Punk has to say, but CM Punk is a big." big star he drives business he his the the interest that he drives allows us to hire more people and allows more people to have jobs and not everyone's gonna like him and i'm sure that's pretty apparent after tonight but you know that's 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 his role he's a big enough star that justifies that um and that's i think kind of like an interesting insight into tony's thinking of the situation which is if he he's a pro, he was definitely aware beforehand, like you mentioned, Dave's report, that maybe not everyone liked CM Punk and that he had some enemies backstage and that maybe CM Punk himself wasn't happy with some of the people backstage. But in his mind, he could justify it by the impact that CM Punk was having on his business. And that's that's how the wrestling business has operated for its entire existence, is that bigger stars who draw money can get away with having bad relationships with people can get away with having enemies in the office can get away with not having people want to work with them or not wanting to work with other people. Um, that's nothing new to the wrestling industry, but I think it did share like an interesting insight into like the way Tony saw things. And obviously he had to address them um, during, you know, whatever that investigation was, but obviously it appears that the young bucks and Kenny Omega have won that war, at least from what we can see right now. One other interesting aspect of it, which I always wonder too, which is, I think something probably still happens. Part of me wonders if Punk doesn't spend a bunch of weeks on the shelf, kind of like, you know, Jimmy Stewart in rear window, just probably stuck in his apartment, fuming, reading all these reports as this story was really exploding and getting more expanded upon. Does he get quite this angry? Like, because... You know, when he comes back, there's that promo, which he, even he seemed to kind of regret when he talked about, like, I, you know, where he's like, I had to do that as a receipt, you know, but even he seemed kind of embarrassed by it on one sense. But you're talking about when he buries Hangman Page. Yeah, yeah. Like, like it, it, this idea that, you know, maybe he came and think, I'm going to do this at the press conference. I'm going to do this one big promo about Hangman stuff. It, it it really felt like a and even just like at that presser where he's like talking to Brian Alvarez and, he's t- and it's clear from yelling at Brian Alvarez that he had been at home listening to clips from like Wrestling Observer Live. Like I just picture yes. Punk during those instead weeks of hurt. seeing a, instead of seeing a murder like in Rear Window, he's like scrolling up the he's scrolling down Twitter and saw a, a ten second Brian Alvarez clip yeah. on Twitter. <laughs> But really, like, like there, there is something to be said for a guy like Punk, who I think, you know, is one of those guys that has to say what's on his mind. The idea that he couldn't react to a lot of this stuff as the story was really growing a bit in real time, that basically for weeks, it was like the media, and he was at home. He couldn't do, he wasn't on TV, you know, he wasn't in public, he couldn't respond to it. And maybe this all just built and built and built in a way where if he was there every week and he could have said something to somebody, maybe it wouldn't have quite exploded to quite this extent. Because it definitely felt like when he came back, he was like a man with a mission. Like, I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to get my receipts, so to speak. You know, I'm going to get some things off my chest. I have to kind of clap back at all these people and, and you know, get my story out in a very dramatic way. And it was the worst possible movie. And, and the amazing thing is, I don't know if you agree, but I think there's a world where Punk could have done that press conference and he could have come out as the good guy. He could have aired certain grievances 
and you could have come up with a lot of people's sympathies. And I don't know how the Bucks and Omega would have reacted to that, but like, if he had just said, "Look, I swear on," and I have no idea what his what his involvement with Colt Cabana getting downshifted was or was, I have no idea. But if he had, you know, he was adamant adamant that he wasn't. So let's say he had just said something to the effect of, "I swear on my life." I had nothing to do with Colt Cabana's booking. I don't, you know, I don't like the guy. My history is clear with him. We were friends. We're not anymore. I don't, uh, but I really don't care what happens to his career. I think the people that have been gossiping behind my back is are, are immature. And I think we should just move past this. I'll leave that at that. I think people would come away with sympathy, but instead he was so angry and so petty and going to things like, you know, Colt Cabana shares a bank account with his mom. Like there, there's a 60 second way of saying the main points Punk wanted to say there where I think he looks like the good guy, oh, whether yeah. or not it's the true story or not, but he was so angry and, and, and rarely, you know, for one of the best, I think one of the best promo guys of all time, certainly one of the best promo guys of his generation, he had the best material in the world and he didn't deliver it in the right way on that day. You know, he, he blew it up and there is one thing. I'll tell you this off the air. I, I hate doing this because I'm not I, – I know like five pieces of – I'm not a news guy. I know like five things in wrestling that aren't public knowledge. I don't compare to probably the average person on Twitter knows 100. But I don't know if this – there's something that's never been reported. I don't want to say because only one person has told me this, but someone I trust. I will say there's one thing I've never seen reported on about that night that if it was out and, and maybe it is out and I just missed it, you can tell me when we talk off the air. It if it was out there and if it's true, it would put Trey Punk in a slightly more sympathetic light. Wow. Is that is that on Dame Select? Are you gonna tell us all that? No, no, no I, I again I, I, I'm not a news guy. I've only been told this by one person not too long after it happened. It, it's not um, an absolutely earth shattering thing, but it is something I can say that would make people more uh, somewhat more sympathetic to punk being so angry that night uh, I, or at least just talking the way he talked yeah i think like like it's, it's a really good point in the sense that like a there was a there's a smarter political messaging that exists where he could get those points off without coming across like the bad guy but he just he went he was just on one that night like Someone asked him a question about MJF, you know, MJF just came back and that was clearly a tease that they were going to go forward with MJF and CM Punk and Punk just like laughs and just like, I'm just so tired of working with fucking children. Like, I'm so tired of these kids. So, he's, you know, he's bearing MJF, who, for all we know, is is distant from this feud he has with the elites. Um, and the way he, a big problem was also and I think this has had, a, again, part of that long term negative impact on AEW and the perception of it is that he just, he really downplayed all of the success that anyone in AEW had before he came. Like he, you know, the way he talked about, I'm trying to make money. I'm trying to run a business. I'm trying to, to be a star. Like I'm trying to do these things. And these incompetent losers who never drew a dime are, are, are getting in my way, which is extremely dismissive of all of the success that Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks and AEW had had pre CM Punk, both within the company and without AEW, and also kind of plays into this notion that like none of these guys are real stars. It doesn't matter that Kenny Omega main evented the Tokyo Dome. It doesn't matter that the Young Bucks like popularized tag team wrestling in this country again. Like it, none of that stuff really matters because it wasn't WWE. And here's CM Punk, big WWE star, coming in trying to be a real star, and all of these little indie wrestlers are getting in his way. And I just thought that perception, you know, that he presented to the public was so negative. And it's something that's maybe lost in the long run because of his personal beefs and the, the incident afterwards with the fight with the elite. But to me, was that was like one of the pretty much the worst thing he said was really downplaying the significance of the company. Uh, and you you know he was honest. You know he wasn't working when he said that. That was those were definitely his true feelings. And I think that was a, that really didn't help AEW's perception as, as an upstart brand. I mean, I wonder if those are his true feelings or if he was in that state, people sometimes get in arguments where you're just saying anything you can to hurt somebody. Because if it is really what he felt, I feel like that that was like in some ways like one of the most tragic parts of the press conference. Because I feel like for CM Punk to like denigrate like 
you know, talking about all the young bucks because you know, they were in Reseda, you know, calling down, basically calling down PWG, you know, like, I feel like that's so tragic and so hypocritical because CM Punk was the poster boy for the indie darling who not just made good, but before he made good, everyone in the big company in WWE, so many people sniped him and and, and, and resented his success on the indies and tried to do, basically do what Punk did in that press conference. You know, you look... For anyone that didn't live through that era, go back and like read the newsletters or the websites during that time. There were so many stories about – there was the classic line about p- higher-ups at WWE have, have said that CM Punk doesn't know how to work. He just simulates good wrestling, whatever that means. And there, and there was – you know, there was people getting mad at him because he was dating Maria and they thought that, you know, she was out of his league like that. A job. classic – a classic like, WWE backstage thing. Like someone is dating a too hot of a woman for what, you know, Kevin Dunn or Vince McMahon or Michael Hayes thinks is, is too attractive for them. So, but yeah, but punk was the guy where there was a lot of guys during that period that would get signed where there was, there would be enough people in WWE that some awareness of you know, like, they would know, hear enough about the Indies and stuff, but there was still a big stigma more than would come in later years of working on the indies. And they'd, it'd be one of those things where it's like, oh, you think they're – like these guys think they're hot shots because they got praise on the indies. Like they need to know how to – we have to teach them really how to work. They're not that good. They don't know how to be stars. They don't, they don't know. know how to find the hard camera, Jesse. Yeah. You need at least a couple of years of NXT. And, and that, that still exists. I mean some some would say that Kenny Omega should go to NXT if he were to be signed. <laughs> to learn how to I've be a star. I mean, but you know, the dumbest people in our society still believe that to a degree. And that was definitely more popular when CM Punk was the like he's really he was really the only indie wrestler that they had that was of prominence. I mean, I'm sure there are guys like you know, like people like Edge did indies before they were signed by WWE. But as far as like what we would consider like the modern indies, kind of like the post WCW, post ECW. Uh, collapses that kind of wave of indie wrestler CM Punk is the first like Brian Danielson is really the second and now there's a bunch in both AEW and in WWE but those were he was really the first person to kind of do that and you're absolutely right there was a lot of resentment towards not 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 just his indie success but his individuality and the fact that he became a successful professional wrestler you know, not going through OVW, not coming up through the WWE system, the way people like John Cena did, the way people like Randy Orton or Dave Batista did. It was a different, you know, he had a, he had his own understanding on how to be a star and he had his own philosophy that wasn't the cookie cutter WWE model. And that's ultimately what made him so popular um, with the fans was because he was different, but because, but it obviously led to a lot of resentment and it's sad for him to like, you know, he lived long enough to see himself become the villain because here he is yeah. now, you know, criticizing these other guys for not knowing how to be a, be a star. And Hangman Page is jeopardizing a million dollar house because with his with his reckless promo actions. And the sad thing is, like, or the weird thing is that um, the Young Bucks and Punk actually have a fair bit in common. And like, like they are both like huge indie stars who really were like some of the centerpieces of their generation on the indies who made a certain degree of the old guard incredibly fierce they both both you know the bucks and punk have very snarky sense of humor they're not worried about clapping back on certain people or pissing people people off they kind of got to the where they did big success by doing things their way kind of stubbornly like both people like the the young bucks certainly have people that you know they're detractors too and people that are annoyed by them so it's weird like it's almost one of those things i guess sometimes where you're almost if someone's too much like you, sometimes you find that to be the most annoying person. <laughs> and again, like to, for Punk to be like, oh, these guys, they just did indies. Punk was, you know, very proud of being an indie guy. He was very proud of the RO, of his ROH roots. He still was. You could see how he got emotional. He talked about Tony Khan buying Ring of Honor and kind of saving its legacy. Like that was a huge part of him. And, and Ring of Honor, when CM Punk worked there, was regularly drawing like 450, 500 people on a great night they, on the, one of their biggest shows during the Punk era. You know, they might, you know, scrape around a thousand, maybe, very rarely. Like, and so to be like, oh, well, those guys never drew anything in Reseda, like Reseda was probably not drawing that much and probably with way higher ticket prices. 
than CM Punk when he worked in ring. I mean, I know that for a fact. I mean, God, those PWG tickets are sky high. Yeah, and he, um, there was a whole kind of like it is. It, you mentioned the word like tragic, and and there's it's it is really sad because there was this thing where when he, CM Punk first came back to the company, which is one of you know CM Punk's debut in AEW is one of the most significant, most memorable moments of um wrestling in the last 10 years like it really is a lot of people would say it might be the peak of AEW as a company so far that that the, you know the rampage the first dance the sold out united center and just the the incredible atmosphere the show starts with his him coming out people are crying in the audience he cuts this tremendous 25 minute promo um it does a monster rating like it was just this incredible moment and his initial kind of, you know, first five or six months wrestling in AEW, he was just this, you know, he just looked like he was having so much fun and he was tagging with Darby and Sting and he was having, you know, a blast and he did the program with MJF and it was like, and, and I remember saying at the time and I was like, for, for, for almost a decade, we heard all of these stories about how CM Punk hates professional wrestling cm punk is this bitter guy he's never going to come back to professional wrestling he hates everything about it he doesn't watch and he's just this sour bitter old guy and he came back and it's like god damn this guy is having so much fun and it's so clear that he loves professional wrestling and it's so great that he's been able to have this chapter in his career after many people had written him off uh and now we're sitting here you know, a year later, and we're having that, I have that feeling again, that now it's like, wow, wow, he's just this bitter guy, and he hates wrestling, and he, he, the, you know, those stories about him were right, was that, you know, the first few months, maybe that was, you know, a little bit of a honeymoon period, but after that, he turned back into being this bitter, grumpy old guy that went out in an incredible blaze of self-destructive glory, uh, at, you know, in that press conference. And it's it's sad to think that this is how it's ended again for him. And I think he had a little bit more, because he was going against WWE and his problems with Vince McMahon and the staff infection and all that stuff like that. And WWE is a more favorable nemesis in a lot of ways than AEW. Like his exit from WWE wasn't nearly as destructive to his own personal image because people kind of enjoyed the fact that he stuck it to the to wwe during an era where basically nobody did that as we previously discussed but now that it's happened again with AEW, now it is kind of like the you know is this guy is this guy maybe this guy just is miserable maybe he'll never he'll always find a way to be angry and maybe he's never going to be happy as a pro wrestler and maybe this this is the right thing for him to do is to not be involved anymore and and that's really sad because there was a period of time where it looked like he was having an amazing time and it was such a gift to professional wrestling that he was back involved and back in the fold. See, I think based on some of his recent social media stuff and the fact that he seems to still want to keep wrestling, like I think from, and from things I've just heard people say, like, it sounds like he did rediscover his love for pro wrestling, but I, I think the thing that kind of depresses people, kind of what you're touching on is I think there are some people that maybe thought, Oh, maybe this strife CM Punk had was only, because of you know bad relationships in WWE and I think people for a lot of people this was their wake up call of you no know, CM Punk is always a guy who has always kind of lived his life with a chip on his shoulder and in some ways that's part of what makes him good as a wrestler is I think he is one of the ultimate like he loves having someone to kind of prove wrong like I've seen so many shows and matches and segments covering things for like Ring, about Ring of Honor all sorts of stuff where Punk is, is the classic case of the guy where I have literally seen shows like this where 99% of a crowd is cheering their head off for him. And if there's one fan that's heckling him, rather than ignore that fan, he will lightning focus on that fan and call attention to the him and yell back at that fan. Like he is that guy where he can't suffer any indignity at all. And again, I think some good parts of his performances come from that but also 
I think it, you know, the AEW thing has served notice to be like, you know, before WWE, you know, in Ring of Honor, I heard people had heard room, anyone that followed the indie wrestling back then, you know, definitely heard rumors that people did, certain people loved CM Punk and certain people didn't hated CM Punk. And that's been basically at every stage of his career. That's just the kind of guy he is. And so, yeah, if anyone's thinking it was just WWE, no, like this is CM Punk. And it's funny, even CM Punk, I think, kind of recognize that because sometimes in the past he's kind of said like hey i can be an asshole but more than that those first few months you talked about in aew where he was so happy it's, it's funny and i even kind of even though i was i i think cm punk's run aew was it some of his best work i loved it i'm like a high voter on that run but one problem some people have with that even i the one thing that was a little missing was it was almost he was too happy. Like he was missing a bit of that chip on the shoulder. And it was something like he had had that at every other stage of his career. I was like, man, it's kind of weird. And it was to the point where even Punk was acknowledging because there's that one promo or something where he was like, he acknowledged that. And he's like, maybe you'll see the old CM Punk one day, but not yet. Like I'm still going to be happy, you know, jumping into the crowd and being happy until, you know, you know, as long as I can, I'm going to savor this. But even he with that one line, it was like, even he knew like, Sooner or later, I'm going to get pissed off. Like, something's going to happen. I, I'm me, you know. A and it, it did. Like, it, just like I said, Dave Meltzer saw it coming, and a lot of people saw it coming. I think it, on some level, even CM Punk, probably in the back of his mind, knew someone's going to piss me off eventually. And maybe not to this extent. But I think even he knew that, so to speak, the old CM Punk would come back. Right. And I think, like, with, with CM Punk, like, he's really... He's definitely he's definitely not the first performer to ever discover this, but he really feels like he really feels like the first he's the first wrestler I ever really saw that had like a modern character, in the sense that he understood that authenticity was super key to him getting over, and so like when he always whenever he spoke he always you should say he had a chip on his shoulder because. You know, that was his character. That was his real life. He always had a chip on his shoulder. So he always came across as authentic when he would talk about how he had a grudge with somebody or he had a grudge with a company or why he wanted a title shot or whatever kayfabe reason he's discussing it. He always felt real. And he would come out in AEW and he would always say like, you know, I'm never going to lie to you people. I'm never going to lie to you fans. And even though he's on a pro, he's a pro wrestling character on a pro wrestling show, I like really believed him. I was like, yeah, CM Punk's not going to come out here. and He's not going to lie to me. Um, and he always has that air of authenticity to him, which in some ways made his meltdown more damaging because again, he's not a liar. He's always going to speak his mind. He's not going to make stuff up. Um, you know, so he, uh, in, in that regards, you're right about like what was missing. You know, he was kind of weird that he was like super happy all the time. I don't know. Is there a way to harness that back? I mean, I guess we could talk about his potential return, but obviously if he were to return, not only would that be a huge box office. Um, let, let, let me start with this. If he returns, does he have to feud with like the elite right away? I, I think that's a huge question because what if he wants, what if they get him to come back, but he doesn't want to work with those guys. Ex exactly. And that's a huge, what if, because to me, let's say they come to a great, you know, the, everyone says, you know what? Punk can come back. We'll just do basically what we were doing before. Like, you guys will never work a program with each other ever. At some point, does that become too much of a distraction? Because the crowd's going to want that. Mm -hmm. And if you see both those entities on the same show week after week after week, and they never mention each other, and they never work together, like – We've just seen what happened with these people when people are talking about them constantly and they can't really like express their views on it. Isn't that just going to restoke those flames if you're like, you're all going to be in the same locker room together. You're never going to be able to talk to each other or do anything with each other. And and also, I think the other big question would be, I, I, I think there's this thought, you know, that CM Punk, you're paying him so much money. He's such a big star. He has to be a baby face. And, you know, on that first run, I would agree. But if he comes back, I do think there's a segment of fans that will not forgive him, at least for a while, especially if they don't really openly acknowledge it and air things out. And I, I think there will also be a group of fans that will absolutely love him and, and be on his side. So I think at best, 
Punk won't be able, if he comes back to AEW, he won't be able to be a pure babyface again. At best, he'll have to be like a tweener because there's going to be, I think, a, I mean, you saw, we've all seen those people when the Elite came back chanting fuck CM Punk, like a big crowd of, you know, mm-hmm. hardcore fans that came to a pay-per-view. I mean, there are going to be fans that even, even the Chicago crowd, you know, was mixed. You, you yeah. think, oh, they're going to completely shit on the Elite. Some of them did. Not all of them. Like... <laughs> If Punk comes back and he's gonna feud with Kenny Omega or he's gonna feud with the Elite, um, you you do not shoehorn like some sort of babyface versus heel angle into that where okay, someone's clearly gotta be the babyface, someone's clearly gotta be be the heel. You just roll those guys out there, they say what they have to say, and some people are gonna organically side with the people that they've already sided with. In, in like real life, like as far as people, how they feel about the elite and who 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 do they blame for the backstage fight and things like that. And some people are going to be the elite and some people are going to be CM Punk. I wouldn't worry about one guy being a heel and one guy being a baby face. But I think you're right. He had to be a baby face at first, but he's obviously an excellent heel. And I think I think he just like he can just come back and he can be CM Punk and he's going to get nuclear heat in some regards. Um, again, if he comes back, which. uh and and I, I think that, like, if he does come back, like, he has to feud with the Elite, like, right away. Like, you have to get that out of the way. Yeah, and... I think get that out of the way is a big thing because the other thing I was going to say is, like, people are going to make comments in the crowd at CM Punk if they don't acknowledge this. And I don't think CM Punk is the kind of guy where he won't – like he he will have to clap back at them and it will eat him alive those comments and, you know there was that one promo where one per like going to my point about like if one person says something to cm punk he will pick out that one person in a sea of cheering fans there was that one aew promo where one fan was like talking about colt cabana in the front row and he like stopped his promo in the middle ground it to a halt just so he could razz that guy like there's going to be way more than one of those fans if he comes back and so yeah like i agree with you like that that worry like they have to do it uh, like my pitch to to the elite and punk if i was trying to get them to work together again if they were all wanting to come back if i could get them to kind of all work in the same company together my pitch to them having to do a program would be not just oh it'll be really good for the company and make money it would also be this it'd be like do you want this to be the question do you want this to be your montreal where people don't stop every reporter and fans ask you about this for the next 20 years of your life. And it comes to like be this huge shadow that defines your careers that had so much good stuff in it. That isn't this weird bullshit. Like I would say to them, if you do one program with each other and you turn it into pro wrestling, everyone will get out of their system. It will become pro wrestling and people won't talk about it that much anymore. You know, it'll be out of everyone's system. People will stop heckling you. It'll all be done. But if you guys don't work together, prepare to have this like haunting you and be constantly asked of you for the rest of your careers. Mm-hmm. And I would just say like, isn't it, isn't it, wouldn't it be worth, if you guys still hate each other's guts just to do this so you can move on and get some relief in your own lives. And people already think, you know, certain people already think that the whole thing is a work already. So, yeah. And, and and even like the Montreal thing, think about that. You know, when I was growing up, Montreal was, you know, it, it used to be a thing back in the days of Observer Radio after, you know, the 1997 Montreal screw job where Meltzer, back when he did the show five days a week and stuff, where there would not go a week that went by when someone would not say Montreal was a work or Bret Hart was wrong. And Meltzer would, you could hear him progressively through the years, just groan And like, I've answered this question so many times and it's never going away. And it doesn't get talked about now. And one of the things that made that you really say it doesn't get put... talked about now. It definitely gets talked about. Dave, okay, is, def- it gets talked Dave about... is definitely answering tweets for, for, with, for accounts with one follower saying Montreal is a, it was an insane. It, it I will say it does not get talked about to one tenth of the level. Yes. It did for 10 or 15 years. And what really stopped that was Bret Hart working a very bad hokey angle with Vince McMahon playing off of it. Cause it was like, okay, you've, you've wrung the juice out of this orange and not even in a good way, but it's like a lot of the mystery and the drama and the tension is gone now. And yet, yeah, and yes, you're right. There are still some people that will bring it up to the day they'll die. There'll be like the Disco Inferno types or whoever they're like, oh, it's still, it's a work, it's a work, it's a work, you know, with no conceivable payoff. But like, um, 
it, a lot of that went away when they just turned it into pro wrestling. Right. You know, it, it removes a lot of the mystique and, and the curiosity. And if he were to come back and work this program, I think it would also solve a lot of maybe some AEW's image issues where, you know, it will no longer be the company that let their biggest star yell, like, bury everyone in a crazy pest conference, get in a fight and then leave. It will be a company that shows that they could problem solve and that people will feel better. Like, great, CM Punk is back in the fold. They, they were able to put it all behind them. They worked this match that had nuclear heat and probably will draw a ton of money. And people will feel much better about the way the company is run and the the feel-good nature of AEW um, and kind of optimism about AEW that they've lost might return uh, if people can see that, like, okay, they were able to solve this problem and they turned it into this great angle where we got to see this great match that everyone wanted to see and it drew 200,000 pay-per-view buys or whatever it would draw. Um, that would help. Not only, I think that would help the perception of AEW tremendously. And, not and, you know, you, you make a good point about, you know, is this something that they want to follow themselves the rest of their career? The CM Punk incident, they want it to be their Montreal. Um, or do they want to show that they can you know, make make money with this. And historically in pro wrestling, when there's been disputes like this, they end up trying to make money with them. It took Brett and Sean and Vince McMahon a very long time. But as you said, they did. I, I don't know if that match drew. I know Bret Hart's return to Raw drew, but I don't know if that... No, uh, I mean, that angle was terribly done. I mean, it, it, the match was not good for understandable reasons because it's a guy that doesn't know how to wrestle versus a guy who can't take bumps do, because do he's you know a stroke surfer. That... Do you know that I thought that match was going to be good? <laughs> like, well, well, you know what? You're not completely crazy because Vince McMahon did have a period where it was like, you know, the Vince McMahon, Shane McMahon, WrestleMania match, or the Vince Hogan, the Vince Sean were so, all perversely entertaining. In different yeah. ways. It was almost like, it, uh, yeah, there was a time where it was like on the biggest stage, Vince had enough a track record where they're like, you would you had kind of this little bit of faith where it's like there's gonna be enough bells and whistles they're gonna find a way to make it work but in, Brett in was my, the one that they couldn't yeah in my mind I was probably like I don't know like 16 at the time uh, of WrestleMania 26 and I remember thinking like oh well you know Sean had a like an entertaining match with Vince McMahon at WrestleMania 22 just four years before. And if Sean could have a good match with Vince, maybe Brett could have a good match with Vince. Um, and then it was just, it wasn't good because obviously Brett couldn't take any bumps. And there was like this whole angle where like the entire Hart family came out to like pretend like they were going to turn on Brett and then they turned on Vince. And it was just, <laughs> it was way, they had, that was during their run where they just had some absolutely awful WrestleMania matches featuring non-wrestlers. Because I believe the Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler match was like either that <laughs> following WrestleMania or the, the WrestleMania after that. But it, it, it was very long and ugh, I, I haven't thought about it in a while. Now, now, now I'm thinking about it again. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean... But again, in a way, like if if, if if Punk and the Elite really want this to die, and people not to really want to talk about it much, do a really bad program together. Just if just, it's bad, yeah. Just take all the tension and the the, the curiosity out of it. Because just do, yeah, you don't I, have to do a program. Just do a, an episode of BTE where y'all make fun of each other. <laughs> Could you imagine? Like we talk about how much um you know they would make. I I you mentioned two hundred thousand buys just to throw on a number of them. i i think they could do i think it would be if you did like an elite versus punk or omega versus punk that would be their biggest pay-per-view ever but could you imagine even if they just did like what wwe did that one time where they did a, a dvd that was just bret hart and Shawn michaels with jim ross interviewing them basically airing out their grievances for over an hour like if you just did that with them like that, I think would sell a lot. If you just did, said, "We're not going to have a wrestling match. We're just going to have a pay per view." That's these guys in a room for ninety minutes arguing. Yeah, like, true. yeah, you can buy. I, you, I would buy that. You can stream it for thirty dollars on BR Live. Um, it, yeah, I mean, and the well, I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't know if Punk and Kenny Omega have like massive heat. No, I mean, yeah, it always sounded like Kenny Omega was the. I mean, I mean, I'm sure he's probably doesn't think great things about Punk, is considering the relationship he's having with his friends and things he said about them. But mm -hmm. it sounds like Kenny Omega was the guy trying to mediate things, and... right? And so you could possibly, maybe CM Punk doesn't want to wrestle Matt or Nick Jackson, but perhaps he would 
be okay working a program with Kenny Omega. And that would, I think, maybe solve it because I think people would see that as Kenny Omega and, you know, CM Punk versus the elite. But, and, and, and Kenny Omega versus CM Punk before any of this, 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 you know, backstage fighting and things like that was a huge money match anyway. Yeah. It's, it's one of the biggest, it's probably the biggest match AEW could do uh, if you just looked at the people who are signed to their roster. And CM Punk, for our knowledge, is still signed to their roster. I think, the one thing I want to say is like, and I don't know if CM Punk really cares about this at all, but if I was CM Punk, um, I do wonder if while he's recovering from his injury and he's thinking about the press conference, he's thinking about the fight, he's thinking about everything that led up to it. And you raise a good point about, you know, before all that happened and he missed a, you know, a few, like a month or two with the, with the foot injury and that maybe kind of hurt his mental state because he just saw all this chatter online that made him angry. Uh, maybe him being out for, you know, eight or nine months is only going to make him even more furious. But, but if I was him and I'm thinking about it and I would think about my exit from WWE and I would think about how I was able to find something again in AEW. And I would think, you know, do I really want to go out like this again? Like, do I really want this to be the end for me in professional wrestling? Is that press conference? And I would like yeah, to it, think that he would say that he would be like, no, I've got to, I've got to have a, my own ending. I want to, I want to do something else. I don't want to go out as this angry person, you know, pounding muffins or cupcakes or whatever he was eating and, and, and yelling about <laughs> my, 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 my coworkers. I would think that he would feel like, you know what? Cause there's, he has so much to gain. By coming back, he really. He, and what, oh, I was, I was no, just gonna I'm say done, one of the I'm big done. things too. Okay, I was sorry about that. I was just gonna say one of the big things is again talking about how like he blew this, like how this will haunt guys forever. Like one of the things that's gotten all this anger from ever from Punk side and led to so much of this was he hated the idea that people were blaming him for Colcaban that he was so tied to this guy that he had grown to hate and all that stuff. It's like. And one of the other kind of tragedies of this is everything Punk's done has made this far bigger. Like his relationship with Cloak went to this thing that maybe mostly hardcore fans like followed the the lawsuit they had together against where WWE sued them and like speculate about little mentions and the fact that Colt wasn't on Dynamite. Like it turned from that into something that now everyone knows about, that everyone talks about. And again, I would just go back to that selling point, like you were mentioning stuff just of – if, if sometimes in life, you know, we've all had this where you think you're right, but you just have to say you're sorry or move on anyway, because the relationship is more important than you being right. Sometimes you just have to eat a plate of shit so you can move on. And I, I think I, again, my selling point to punk would just be like, if you want a happy ending, maybe some aspects of this, you are in the right, but just, take eat the plate of shit and move on and the problem is when i look at punk's career and punk's life and his personality i kind of feel like he's is a guy who's never eaten the plate of shit like he's like cm punk is a guy who he he cannot it, it, he always seems to me like a guy who cannot take an insult to him in any sense or form without eventually getting his comeback and so that's the fascinating thing to me is he has the power i think to really craft his own happy ending to really make this right whether how much of this was his fault or not his fault but i don't know if it's in him to do the thing that it would require yeah like he's stubborn to a fault in that extent and like you said we've all we've all been in situations where we kind of apologize for something even if we feel like we didn't really do anything wrong just to move on just to smooth things over just to make somebody feel better um I don't know, because like it's not like CM Punk just has to give out a heartfelt apology. He then probably has to work a program with these people, yeah. where in the program, you're kind of going to have to do some work to shoot stuff and make some comments alluding to the fight and things like that, if you really want to get the most out of it. And I would like them to all come together and understand that that's the best thing for business and that's what the fans would want to see and that's the best thing for all of their careers from a reputation standpoint would be to work a successful program like that. And I don't know, we've seen CM Punk be stubborn. We've seen him walk away from WWE. We've seen him be okay not being involved in pro wrestling. 
Um, so he's someone that it's really hard to predict. And I think like we talk about like historically, like you mentioned the Bret Hart, you know, Shawn Michaels feud, eventually they ended up working that into a story and, you know, guys getting fights and things backstage. And I thought, you know, Phil Schneider, uh, who writes for the ringer now was, he said, had an interesting point, I think a week ago, he said something along the lines of like, you know, talking about how he thinks CM Punk will come back and the elite will, they'll get the work together and they'll do something. And he said like, you know, if Bruiser Brody survived his stabbing, you know, he would probably wrestle in Vader like later that year. Well, because again, that, the funny thing, funny that's thing the way is the business more, was. Yeah. But, but uh, you, you had, I think you said kind of the counter to that just a little bit ago, which is just a minute earlier, which is CM Punk is a guy who did something that I think very few wrestlers would do, which is he walked away from a WrestleMania payday in a major WrestleMania match and basically shut down his wrestling career in the prime years of his career. Like, he, this is a guy, I would say like 99% of wrestlers would do, or 95% or something, CM Punk's that guy who might be the 1%, you know, who would literally cut off his nose to spy his face and be like, fuck you. Let people think what they want. Let I'll throw the money away. Like, Yeah, and he's not materialistic and he doesn't seem like a guy that would would uh you know need i don't know he he it didn't it never seemed like he was strapped for cash when he wasn't in wwe i know he did other things and he obviously probably made a decent amount of money through his mma fighting but um i don't know if he's gonna you know we've seen this in wrestling where guys walk out and then like a, a few years later they need money and they come crawling back to vince there are um, avenues he could do to make money i mean he could write a book he could i mean he he will probably make if he wants a healthy money right now on the autograph circuit you know i mean it's not going to be aew or wwe money but this has kind of rejuvenated his name a little bit like i am sure there are avenues he has if he would like to make some extra money but the one other thing it would be i would say is if you're if we're trying to if you and I are trying to fantasy book arguments for CM Punk to work with the elite, I would say is like if, if you were to put out a statement right now, if CM Punk was able to to say, you know what, there's I have some things, I some legit grice, but you know what? I apologize. I acted immature. I would uh, I am sorry to the Kenny Omega, I'm sorry to the Young Bucks, I'm sorry to Colt Cabana. I would love to come back and I would love to work with them. You put the ball so much in their court, all the pressure now shifts to them. Because now fans would be like, you guys better forgive Punk. We want to see this. Like, if you really want to put pressure on them, like, like if Punk, had, like if I have no idea what the Bucks and the Omega want, but let's say that they really don't ever want to do something with CM Punk. If you're CM Punk, kind of a, a very ingenious move to stick it to them would be to do that. Because then all the pressure's on them. If you were just like, I'll do it. I'm sorry. I'll work with them. Yeah. Like, I want to do it. Let's do it right now. I mean, like, that's now a typical they're move. in trouble. That's a typical move you see in politics where it's like, oh, look, I want to pass this bill. It's those other people that don't. And I'm ready yeah. to sign it. You know, if, if it doesn't get signed, it's because of them. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, we have a much, I feel like we have like kind of a better, maybe we don't, but I feel like we have a better understanding of like kind of the way CM Punk holds grudges versus the way like maybe the Young Bucks hold grudges. It, it would seem to me that if CM Punk would be willing to work with the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega, those guys would be a, would be game for it. So I, I do think the ball is entirely in Punk's court. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega need an apology from Punk. I think perhaps they would like the support of their owner in the conversation. I think that might be important to them, but I don't know if they need CM Punk to admit that he was wrong that much, as much as they would just need support from Tony. And I think that was a whole part of this was that who is Tony going to side with? Is he going to side with the elite who are the founding members of the company? And he couldn't, he definitely couldn't have started the company without them. Or is he going to side with CM Punk, who's his biggest star, and clearly had a lot of influence over the product once he was brought on board? And I think, oh, go on. I was just going to, and I want to add, like, I think part of the motivating factor for CM Punk, beyond just money, was that I think he really enjoyed the idea that he was building something here. He was building a, a major company, a competitor to WWE, and he alluded, he said that a lot during his presser, saying he's, oh, I'm trying to run a business, which I thought was is an arrogant thing to say regarding the company. But he was, I think he did enjoy working with younger talent and helping guys get over and 
wanting to to build something serious with AEW. And I think that maybe that 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 it's not like he can't do that anymore. That, that possibility still exists. Yeah, and that, that's actually a really good point to bring up too, because I think one thing that doesn't get talked about enough, one aspect of this whole thing is in that press conference, one thing that Punk talked about where you could tell he was hurt by was the idea that not every wrestler to listen to his advice. And when, when he came back, you could tell one thing he was really priding himself on was the idea that, you know, I'm going to, like Punk always a guy, whatever you want to say about Punk, when Punk was coming up in the Indies, he was a guy that was always very generous with his praise for all the veterans that looked out for him and, and taught him. Like he would always have big praise for the couple of times he worked with Eddie Guerrero or Chris Candido or Tracy Smothers, all these guys. And it definitely felt like when Punk came in from all sorts of comments he made that he kind of saw himself like, all right, I'm now this is the stage of the career. I'm going to be, you know, Chris Candido. I'm going to be Tracy Smothers. I'm going to teach these guys a bunch of stuff. I'm going to be the veteran. I'm going to pass on my information to the new generation. And that last press conference, you could really tell with some of the anger and some of the comments he's making, he was really hurt that not everyone wanted to listen to him. Mm -hmm. You know, some wrestlers did, like Will Hobbs has praised him. I'm sure there's a lot of, I've heard people say that there's a bunch of wrestlers backstage that really like punk. There was that story that came out that, you know, CM Punk stays and watches every match from dark on, you know, and he will give advice to anyone that asks for it, where they would contrast that with the elite who will leave right after, you know, their match or whatever, and are not doing that, even though they're executives. Like, I think Punk is a guy who desperately wanted to give back, and he's kind of hurt that not every single wrestler wants his advice, and, right. and I think that's a thing. And he, he said that about, like, and Hangman Page basically said, like, I don't really take advice. He, like, basically said that. And I think that obviously bothered him. And I think there's there's an element to this here where if Punk is coming in and he wants to give advice to all these guys, and if I'm Hangman Page and I'm already a successful big star, is is do I feel like this is a patronizing thing where I'm being mistreated because Punk is coming in and he's giving me this advice like I'm a rookie? Um, someone like Will Hobbs, who hadn't achieved much on the on a national stage in his career, uh, that 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 probably has a different, he has probably a different tolerance for CM Punk's uh, comments and, and, and guidance and advice and whatever you want to call it. But someone like Paige, someone like the Bucks, maybe they don't want to hear it. The Bucks certainly, um, you know, the Bucks career is them basically doing things that, that the vet, old vets didn't tell, told them not to do. So yeah, I could see them kind of having, having an adverse relationship to that. And honestly, I don't think like this, I don't think like the young Bucks like need advice from CM Punk. Well, I think that's also a, fa a fascinating thing about them. If they had to work a program together, is I also don't know how their matches would go because I feel like Punk's philosophy of wrestling and the Bucks' philosophy are dramatically different. I could just see them butting. If they weren't already having animosity to each other, I could see them butting heads just on laying out matches. I don't know. You These know? are very smart, capable layout people. I agree they are, the, but they're, Punk they're... likes to wrestle in a way that, I mean, I I think wrestling has changed where Punk is a classic, call it in the ring, you know, think on the fly, slow things down a little bit, you know, and the Bucks are more, you know, they can do a lot of things, but they're more of the modern layout, more go, 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 choreograph a bit more so we can really go at a fast pace and... That's not Punk's world, you know. I mean, I think the Bucks can work on another thing, but I could see them fighting over how much to go into each world. Mm -hmm. And and to be fair, like I think, like if CM Punk were to wrestle the Young Bucks, he wouldn't be wrestling. Like the yeah, he'd have partners. Maybe it's FTR. Who knows? Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say, like, like, and that was kind of a thing. Was like, I didn't really have any problems with CM Punk's in ring performance in AEW, but I know there were some people who were underwhelmed by it. Um, maybe that's just. A I thought he was style. great. I mean, I, I love the stuff like the Eddie Kingston match. I mean, yeah, I mean, I thought ways... he had, you know, he was he had plenty of four star matches for me. Um, I, I was gonna say, mechanically, I think he was better than he had been a lot of stages of, of his career. Like he was not, you know, a lot, some of the sloppiness was gone. I mean, he, no one's gonna say Punk is a guy who like is velvety smooth and makes it look easy, but. I felt like in some ways he was as mechanically sound as he had ever been. And obviously he still had the great grasp of psychology and all of that. I mean, and he's a big star in the fans. Like even like, like, like if we get this dream match between like Kenny Omega and the young bucks versus like CM Punk and FTR, like 
Will the match be clunky, perhaps? But like, it's going to have such a, if it's done correctly, it's going to have such an electric atmosphere that I don't think anyone's really going to have a problem if there's some weird spots in it. So my question for you, this is kind of on a different topic. I, I want to ask this too, which is my thought about this is obviously Omega and the Bucks, their contracts are coming up in the relatively near future. There's reports, you know, in the, I think in one of the most recent observers, Dave wrote that, you know, um, Khan's interested in starting negotiations, trying to re-sign Omega and the Bucks. Omega's doing, doing his usual thing where he's making very vague comments about he doesn't know what he wants to do yet, you know, which we've seen him do that before. So who knows where his mind's really at. But part of me feels like if you're Tony Khan, do you kind of have to get an answer from Omega and the Bucks very quickly? And does that change? Does that answer change what you do with Punk? Because to me, part of me, I've started to think the worst thing that could happen to AEW is not losing Omega and the Bucks. It's losing Omega and the Bucks, and then not lose, and then also losing Punk. Like to me, I wouldn't want to make a final decision on Punk until I had Omega and the Bucks locked in one way or the other. Like I, I think it would be a nightmare disaster. If if Punk and the Bucks signed with WWE, I mean Omega and the Bucks signed with WWE after you had said sign like we're gonna you know buy Punk out, we're gonna end this relationship for good. If you lose out on both sides of that, I I, I would I would go to the Buck the Bucks and Omega right now and just be like, we need to hammer this out in the next month or two. In the back of my mind, maybe not telling them, I would be saying to myself because if you say no, I'm I'm gonna go back to Punk. You know, I'm gonna say you were all right, buddy. Yeah, and we, you know we really we really don't know anything about those details. For all we know, Trevor, CM Punk and the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega have already made up, and yeah. they're already they're all on the same page, and they're ready to to work together when CM Punk comes back. MJ know- was echoing all of the Punk stuff in that press conference between eating while he was being angry. You know, yeah, he's, he's been using some of the best of the world so, stuff. He's so he's so great. Like that whole, yeah. like the whole, the imagery of him. He, what was he? He was eating what pistachios or something? Pickles. He was eating he, pickles, he, he, and he had the he had the towel the way Punk had. And he was, he kept the blood on his face, like like that's something that like almost nobody realized, but then it was pointed out, and I was like, God yeah, damn. And, you know, calling himself the best in the world and doing all of that, and he mentioned even Punk when he was talking about the guys he's beaten, like in in. You know, maybe that means nothing. Maybe that's just something MJF can get away with because he's MJF. But in a company that's been like no one's allowed to mention punk at all he was openly referencing him in in both things he was saying and things he was doing like seven different ways in that press conference and like you like i was kind of surprised at how little people were focusing on that yeah he's yelling at brian and dave just like cm punk did yeah exactly he 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 like like people were just going oh it, it mjf just doing the mjf stuff he was completely doing the punk press conference yeah, I don't know if Hausman was there. He should have yelled at Hausman first. <laughs> um, all right, is there anything else you want to add? I think that that kind of covers up my talking points. Um, no, I'm 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 good. I, I'm pretty good. I... Yeah. All right. Well, this was a, a good show. Um, do you have any plugs you want to you want to plug for us? Yeah, I have a few things. Uh, through the years is the Ring of Honor podcast I do with my friend Matt Feuerstein. It's spelled T H R O H for through, like you know, it's a little pun on the Ring of Honor name. Uh, we've been doing it for this month will be six years. We've we review it's a review show. We review every Ring of Honor show starting from the beginning, going in chronological order. We've done over a hundred episodes, which means we've reviewed every single major CM Punk Ring of Honor match ever. I think there's been a couple pre-show matches we didn't cover, but every main card match we've reviewed, every angle, every promo. Um, I have written for a bunch of websites, including uh, your old alma mater, uh, Wrestling Inc. I've written for Fanbyte. I've written for, so you can see my work there. If you want to uh, give me an offer to pay me a little bit of money to talk about wrestling over a lot of money, uh, Trevor Dame at gmail trevor dame sells out at gmail.com um my twitter is at trevor dame it's d-a-m-e-m as in mother um yeah that's uh that's all my stuff actually all right well thanks so much you're an excellent guest i know uh, i definitely want to hear that i know that will help you go to sleep at night um But uh, thanks so much for joining the show. And obviously, thanks so much to all of our listeners who have been watching. Uh, make sure to, if you leave a review, 
for the show on your podcast app of choice. I, I I actually don't know much about it, but I've told every podcast I listen to always begs for people to leave reviews. So I'm only led to believe that it must be incredibly paramount to the success <laughs> of podcasting to get good reviews on like Spotify. So please leave a good review. If you have a bad review, just, just keep that to yourself, but please, if you have a good <laughs> review, uh, please let us know. And uh, thanks everyone so much. And I'll, I'll see you guys again in a couple of weeks. Do you like wrestling trivia? Then check out the five-star match game, the Pro Wrestling Quiz Show. I'm Joe Gagne, and every episode, I grill three contestants with five rounds of power-packed wrestling trivia. We have over 30 evergreen episodes in the archives covering WWE, AEW, Japan, Mexico, and much, 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 much more. Play along at home and check it out today. Hello, everyone. My name is Taylor. And I'm Kelly. And we are the co-hosts of Jumping Bomb Audio, the podcast all about Joshi Pro Wrestling here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Every other Monday, we are with you talking about the biggest news in Joshi, along with show reviews, previews, and much, much more. So if you're new to Joshi or you've been a longtime fan, this is the show for you. We've got something for everyone here. So check us out, Jumping Bomb Audio.